Let's read our scriptures. If you have a Bible, please open it to 1 Corinthians 15. These verses will be on your screen if you're tuning in. Let's begin reading in verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, to one untimely born, He appeared also to me. Look with me at verse 12 also. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Skip to verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jump down with me to the last verse in the chapter to verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers... Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let us pray. Father, who is a God like you? Merciful and gracious, pardoning iniquity, casting our sins under the depths of the sea, trampling them under your feet in your mercy. We give you praise today as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pains of death could not hold Him in power. You raised Him from the dead, attesting to the fact that He is the only begotten Son of God. This is our confession this morning. We believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. We believe and confess with our mouths that You raised Him from the dead. Father, we look to You today. Speak to us from your word. It is settled. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And we give you praise. Amen. Well, he came in late. Probably a typical Baptist. Disgusted, he sat with his face in his hands, wondering why he had even come. He feels so out of place. Where else could he go? On Friday, he had violated every one of his cherished beliefs. He had done the very things that he swore he would never do. And now it's Sunday. And Peter sits in the corner, staring, feeling guilty, scared, and alone. Just too much to handle, too much to take in. His courage had melted away with midnight fear. And now he wondered if God had even a place for him anymore. She had been hurt. The pain for her was overwhelming. Jesus had been the only man that had ever treated her with respect that didn't use her or abuse her. And now he was dead and gone, or so she thought. Mary's grief was affecting her mind. The rest of the disciples thought she had lost it. She tried to tell them, but they wouldn't believe her. They wouldn't listen. She could have swore she saw him. They were all thinking it, but nobody would say it. Was it really true? He told us he would, but that's impossible, right? But what if it's not? What then? Suddenly, there he is, standing in the middle of the room. They can see the nail prints in his hands. Thomas even touched where the spear pierced his side. They know it's him. It's undeniable. When we put ourselves in that upper room with the disciples, I hope it elicits strong emotion in you like it does with me. But our confession is more than just a feeling. It is more than just good doctrine. Our confession is an historical fact. And as such, a defense needs to be made. In an age of skepticism and uh, 
intellectualism, and even mysticism, our celebration of the resurrection demands an explanation. When we look at all the evidence as a whole, and when we put it all together, we can come to a comprehensive and a reasonable conclusion. One that we read in verse 20 in 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. That's the approach that the Apostle Paul takes in 1 Corinthians 15. To a church situated in a culture not too dissimilar to ours and in a similar vein to modern apologetics, he takes several arguments in defense of the fact that Jesus died and was buried and on the third day he rose again. I'd like to take the rest of our time this morning and highlight each of those arguments and then arrive at one necessary and I think very relevant conclusion. The first argument we find in verses 1 and 2, and it is the classical argument, also known as the theological argument. And the classical form of apologetics starts with God as the moral first cause. He is the matter of fact that causes all other things. For example, as you look at verses 1 and 2, you see the gospel that was preached mentioned to them and the strength of their confession and the fact that they stood firm in it. The gospel that is preached does not prove God or the resurrection. It doesn't prove it because it saved them. It doesn't prove it because they stood firm in it. God proves the resurrection. God proves the gospel. God allows them to stand firm in their faith. God, as a matter of fact, as the moral first cause, proves all of those other things and not the other way around. So that's the classical argument that Paul takes in verses 1 and 2. We also see the evidential argument in verses 3 through 8. Here, Paul, as an attorney, submits two different forms of evidence in, to the court, if you will. The first we find in verses 3 and 4, and that is the Word of God. Now, this is highly significant because God submits his own testimony into state's evidence, if you will. Christ died according to the Scriptures. He was buried and raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is God's own revealed testimony in his Word. And this also reveals something else to us if we're paying attention. It reveals that the cross and the resurrection were events that God predetermined to happen. Matthew 16, 21, Jesus explains that He must, He must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. He must be killed and He must on the third day be raised. He must. It's the same thing that Paul testifies to here. Submitting God's word into evidence. This is not a reaction. It must happen because it was providentially decreed by God in His Word. Christ the sacrificial lamb without spot or blemish was chosen, foreordained before the foundation of the world. John Piper explained this week in one of his podcasts that, and I love how he put it, and I quote, reactionary in random events redeem no one. The resurrection was not a recoiling reaction to the cross. It was something that God prepared beforehand in His own mind and according to His own purpose. And we know this because the Scriptures declared that it must happen. And so when we're looking at the evidential argument for the resurrection, we look to God's Word, God's own testimony, submitted as evidence to the fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. But there are also many witnesses. We turn now to the second form of evidence and the many witnesses now that take the stand and testify in court that Christ has been raised. Verses 5 through 8. For the sake of argument, because that is the argument and why the argument is even made. This has been claimed by some skeptics that to be the greatest hoax ever perpetrated upon mankind. If that were the case... If this were the greatest hoax that has ever been perpetrated upon mankind, the circle of information would have been kept tight. 
The flow of information had to be controlled. But that's not what we find. Not at all. Having been raised from the dead, Jesus was seen first by Peter. He was also seen by Mary that we mentioned earlier and some other women. But then he was also seen by the twelve in the upper room. Five hundred at one time. James, the Lord's brother. Then the apostles, probably a reference to the seventy. And at last, by Paul, one untimely born. It is significant that all of these people are mentioned because Jesus appears to them at different times. It's a very large group of people. The circle is not kept close. The information is not controlled. It's not kept tight. And it's also significant because at the time of this writing, each one of these people could have been interviewed. Some had died, but at the time Paul was penning this letter to the Corinthians, These people could be looked up, they could be found, they could be interviewed, cross-examined, their reports corroborated and investigated. And we find that they all bear the same record. They saw Jesus die, they saw Him live again. And so in a legal sense, the evidence of the resurrection could be established in court at the mouths of two or three witnesses that agree this is empirically true and proves to be true in a legal sense. And so we have the classical argument. God being the moral first cause. And then we have the evidential argument. The word of God and the many witnesses submitted into evidence supporting the fact of the resurrection. And then we have the presuppositional argument. Verses 12 through 19. There are some negative presuppositions that are assumed to be true And the following problems present themselves here in verses 12 through 19. Let me reiterate something before we go any further. These are negative hypothetical assertions, okay? If there is no resurrection, then the following things must by necessity, by presumption, be true. And so as we're looking at the text there in verse 13, if there is no resurrection then Christ is still in the tomb. Mary went to the grave on, the, on Sunday morning looking for Jesus, but if Christ is still in the grave, then she went to the wrong one. Peter and John went to the wrong one. Maybe, maybe the disciples did steal his body. But here's the fact. To deny the resurrection is to deny that Christ lives that He is currently seated at the right hand of God, it is to deny that we will one day live again. And so if there is no resurrection, then Christ is dead and buried somewhere. If there is no resurrection, then number two, then the gospel is in vain, verses 14 and 17. It's useless to preach. It's pointless to believe. What is the point, after all? Why would we go through the motions and do the things that we do if the gospel is in vain, if Jesus is in the grave? According to Romans 10 and 9, not only must we confess the Lord Jesus with our mouths, but we must believe in our hearts that God has raised, God has raised Him from the dead in order to be saved. That's an empty promise if Jesus is in the grave. It's in vain. The gospel is in vain and it is pointless to believe of no use to proclaim the gospel. Number three, if there is no resurrection, then sadly we have misrepresented God. What is more, we have misrepresented Him because He has misrepresented Himself. That To say that there is no resurrection is to say that God Himself is a liar. And we are told in the Scriptures that God cannot lie but to say that there is no resurrection that means that the promise god made in the resurrection the foretaste of coming glory and coming heaven is vain it's empty and the work that christ did upon the cross is of no effect he was simply murdered and died as a common criminal it's all a lie if there is no resurrection then there is also no hope of eternal life 
You see where we're going with this as we follow along with the Scriptures, verses 16 and 18? If Christ is not raised, then the souls and the bodies of an innumerable host of people are dead and gone, forever perished. We will never see our loved ones again. These mortal bodies that find their way back to the dust from whence they were created will never be raised to the newness of life. That Christ Jesus Himself is not the first fruits of the resurrection. There is no reward for faith if this is the case. There is no torment for unbelief if this is the case. If Christ remains in the tomb, if He is still dead, then there is no hope of eternal life. If there is no resurrection, then we must say also, according to the Scriptures, that there is no atonement. Atonement has not been made. If Jesus is not at the right hand of the Father today, if He did not rise from the grave and ascend back to heaven and take His rightful place of authority next to God on His throne, then the Father did not accept His sacrifice. And no atonement for sins has been made. The person who denies the resurrection is still in his sins and has not been delivered from sin's guilt or power. That person is doomed to continue to live in sin, repeating history, and doomed to experience the punishment for every single one of them in eternity. No atonement has been made if Christ is still in the tomb. If there is no resurrection, then finally, we conclude that Christianity is nothing more than a pitiful delusion. Verse 19. If this is the case, if Christ is still in the tomb, the Christian faith is essentially nothing more than a cruel delusion. The gospel promises eternal life. Jesus said He comes to give joy abundantly and to the full, unending, infinite joy that He bestows upon us His peace through the seal of the Holy Spirit. But in the end, it would just be that. It would be the end. All would be lost. There would be no benefit in this life or the next. Our faith would be reduced to a pathetic fantasy if Christ is still in the grave. This is the linchpin for our faith. Christ died according to the Scriptures and was buried, and on the third day He rose. In fact... Christ has risen from the dead. We can raise a hallelujah about that, can we not? We also see the philosophical argument. We're skipping over some verses here as we look down to verses 35 through 57. Philosophically, analyzing what this will look like and how this will happen, all of that can be summed up in verse 50. From that standpoint, as we analyze the evidence, as we try to figure out what this is all going to look like and how it is going to take place, we read in verse 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, for us to get to heaven, there has to be a profound change. There has to be some sort of victory over the enemy of death and the grave. Why? Because this dying, fallen, futile, physical body that I have, that you have, that we have all inherited from Adam cannot, in that state, inherit the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is immortal, eternal, incorruptible. The perishable, this body, must put on imperishable. The mortal, this body, must put on immortality. That is the change that must take place. And only then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so as we look at the philosophical argument, we know that The physical, flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, the eternal. So a change must take place. The grave must be defeated. Death must be defeated. And that happens in Christ's resurrection from the tomb on the third day. And so now, loved ones, we arrive at an ethical conclusion. We look back at verse 20 and we look forward to verse 58. All of those potential negative outcomes... 
that have been presented or answered in verse 20. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Negations and speculations give way to affirmations of truth. With absolute certainty, Christ lives. Let me say that again. With absolute certainty, Christ lives. Therefore, loved ones, we can come to the conclusion of verse 58. This is how we must ethically and morally live our lives in light of the fact that Christ lives. We can stand firm and we can abound in the work. We can be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's unpack that for a minute. To be steadfast means to be seated, kind of like I am and maybe like you are right now. To be seated, to be stable. Immovable implies the same idea but with more intensity. It is a refusal to be moved away from the truth. Because of the resurrection, our labor for the Lord can abound in the same way because we are stable, immovable. We refuse to be moved away from the certainty, the fact that Christ has been raised from the dead. And so that our labor then can abound in the same way that His grace abounds toward us. Romans 5.20 says where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Where sin sets a, a high water mark, Grace comes in like a flood and washes it all away. Where, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. It, it casts our sin under the depths of the sea. It separates our iniquities from us as far as the east is from the west. That our labor can abound in the same way God's grace abounds to us. And in the same way, according to Ephesians 1 and 3, that He lavishes upon us. Same word. Every spiritual blessing. That God has not withheld any good from us because He has already given us His very best when He delivered up His Son for us all. How can He not also with Him freely, graciously, lavishly bestow upon us all things? Amen? So in other words... As we sum all of this up, our labor overflows because our hope overflows. And our hope overflows because of the certainty of the resurrection. What we do for the Lord in the name of the Lord Jesus is not empty. It's not futile. It's not vain. It is not without meaning or purpose. It is not ineffectual. Sometimes it seems that way, doesn't it? Sometimes it seems like we're beating our head against a wall. Sometimes it's so frustrating. We wonder if we're even really accomplishing anything at all. But understand, because of the resurrection, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. We can be assured that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our faith, our work, none of those things are in vain because of the resurrection. And we can say that with absolute confidence. Because in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So quiet yourself. I know you wish this was over and so do I. I can't wait to gather again and see you all face to face. I'm an introvert and I'm longing for a hug. I know you wish this was over and so do I. But because of the certainty of the resurrection... We all need to quiet ourselves, to steal our minds. It is settled. Christ lives. And because of that, we can keep going. We can keep serving. We can keep putting one foot in front of the other. We can keep doing. We can keep being kind. We can keep being long-suffering. We can keep being patient. We can keep enduring because it's been settled. He lives, and He is seated at the right hand of God where He ever lives to make intercession for you.
And because of that, he makes a promise that he will never leave you or forsake you. Your love, your faith, your labor, it is not in vain, loved ones.